be done on Thursday night as, in, instead. And also, as our tradition at the beginning of the annual town meeting, the chair reminds town meeting members and informs newly elected members about some of the basic rules and how we will proceed. When you are recognized, please wait until you have the microphone before speaking. In addition to being heard in the hall, we want you to be heard on RCTV as well. The tapes from the cablecast may be used in verifying the official report. Before speaking, please state your name and precinct. Members are limited to no more than 10 minutes. The chair will call on people roughly in the order that they raise their hands, taking those who have not spoken yet first. Non-members may speak, but only after members have first had the opportunity to do so. Non-member proponents of a motion may speak with permission of the body. Remember to stay away from personal attacks, or for the most part, personal references. We are here to discuss issues and not personalities. A couple of years ago, we instituted a new practice. We no longer read the motion, since all of you have a printed copy. The only time we read it is if there is a change from what you have. The moderator instead declares the motion has been made. We then call on the main proponent to open discussion. Then we hear relevant reports. Financial articles are reported on by the Finance Committee, bylaw changes by the Bylaw Committee, and so forth. Then we open debate to all members. After debate has proceeded for a while, we may have someone move the previous question, or simply move the question. That is a call for debate to end. The motion itself is non-debatable, and we will proceed directly to the issue of stopping debate. It takes a two-thirds vote. The chair will not recognize that motion from a person who has just spoken. In other words, if you want to move the question and stop debate, that must be the only thing you have risen for. Amendments. We may have people offer amendments to motions on the floor. These, of course, will be accepted. Once an amendment is proposed and seconded, we debate only the merits of the proposed amendment, not the main motion. When ready, we vote on the proposed amendment, then we return to debating to the main motion, either as it stood before the proposed amendment or as amended, depending on how the vote to amend went. When proposing amendments, please provide them to the town clerk on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, preferably, in order to get your wording correct. Town meeting members must be sitting in the lower portion of the hall if they want to be recognized as town meeting members and have their votes counted. Instructional motions. Article 3 is placed in the warrant by the Board of Selectmen and calls for instructional motions. These motions instruct various boards or individuals to do whatever the motion calls for. Technically, state law does not allow motions to be made when the subject matter does not first appear in the warrant. They have traditionally been allowed here because they are non-binding. Our bylaws stipulate that all main motions, which these are, must be made in writing. Additionally, I ask that they be written on an eight and a half by 11 sheet containing nothing but the motion. Otherwise, they could be lost up here on the table. The chair will enforce that rule. In addition, I would ask that whenever practical, all such motions be presented to the moderator at the beginning of each night's session. At some convenient point, the chair will inform the body what the intended instructional motions what have been presented. This is being done in fairness to those being instructed and deserve some semblance of notice, and to town meeting members who, when making decisions as to whether or not to adjourn for the evening, should know what business is still before them. Unlike all regular motions, members may have no idea what type of instructional motions may be made. There is often confusion with two particular motions, indefinite postponement and tabling. Let me give you a brief explanation of the difference. Indefinite postponement is a motion that the body not vote for a particular motion during the life of this town meeting. Although it is thought of not so much as a vote against a particular issue, but rather a postponement, the result is the same. Voting in favor of indefinite postponement has the same result as voting against the main motion. If indefinite postponement carries, the main motion is defeated. A motion to indefinitely postpone is debatable. Tabling is used for another purpose altogether. Tabling temporarily puts a motion aside. It can be brought up again by anyone moving to take it from the table any time before the meeting adjourns sine die. This motion is non-debatable, although the chair will allow a brief explanation as to why the motion to table has been made. Adjournment. There are two types of adjournment. At the end of an evening, we adjourn to a time certain. Tonight, for instance, when we are done for the evening, we presumably will adjourn until Thursday. When we are done with all of the business of the town meeting, we adjourn sine die, which translates to without day. In other words, the meeting is complete. Please use non-audible alarms for your phones and any other gadgets you might have. Finally, I would like to explain how things are likely to proceed over the next few hours and the next few days. 
Uh, Article 2, we will hear some reports, but we will lay it on the table so there will be more on Thursday. And Article 3 is uh, traditionally postponed until the last item of town meeting. We are, we will try to get as far as we can tonight, we, the um, uh, budget will not be taken up until Thursday. With that, I believe we are ready to begin. Uh, business under Article 2, I believe we begin with Mr. Ensminger. Chair of the Light Board to join me if he cares to. Thanks, Phil. Mr. Moderator, fellow town meeting members, at the May 1, 2017 adjourned session of the 2017 annual town meeting, the following instructional motion was passed. Instruct the Board of Selectmen, in light of the town's difficult financial situation, to study the Reading Municipal Light Department with an objective of increasing annual revenues to the town of Reading. Since 1997, the annual RMLD below the line payment to Reading, currently over $2.4 million per year, has been in indexed to the Boston Area Consumer Price Index. The CPI index increased 2 to 4 percent annually from 1997 to 2006, but has increased less than 2 percent per year up through the previous year. Town, meeting, town meeting's goal was to come up with a more steady and predictable formula for this increase, ideally more in line with Reading Town Government's annual run rate of 2.5 to 3 percent per year, but also consistent with RMLD's projected earnings and capital needs requirements. During the debate on this instructional motion, Chairman Pacino of the RMLD Board of Commissioners suggested that the Subcommittee for Payments to the Town of Reading, which had been created in 1998 by the RMLD's Citizens Advisory Board but never activated, be used to negotiate such an agreement. The members subsequently appointed to the subcommittee were Phil Pacino and John Stempick from the RMLD Board, George Hooper and Neil Cohen, the Wilmington and Reading members of the CAB, and myself from the Reading Board of Selectmen. The subcommittee met once in September 2017 and again in February, March, and April of 2018. Initial proposals for the indexing of payments were exchanged at the subcommittee between the RMLD and the town. Presentations were then given by RMLD Chair Pacino and the RMLD General Manager. The sum of the uh, below the line amount that can be paid to Reading when added to the RMLD capital funding is limited to 8% of the RMLD's net plant value. It's one of the constraints on uh, what we're talking about. Additional RMLD concerns voiced at the subcommittee included the need to rehabilitate large portions of the RMLD physical plant and the recently observed decline of power revenues year over year. Ironically, due to sh shred, shred the peak conservation measures, and buyback of excess renewable power generated by homes and businesses. The general manager suggested that the RMLD commission a study of future power revenues under a variety of economic growth scenarios before any new indexing formula for payments to Reading is agreed to by the subcommittee. In its April 11th meeting, the subcommittee voted unanimously to keep the CPI index in place until such a study is completed. This study should be completed, I think, Phil, you said six months, hopefully. I had eight to ten, but I'll take six. Six, six months for the study, at which time the subcommittee can take the matter up again. In the meantime, Reading is making out well on calendar year 2018 with a rebound in the CPI. It's up to two and a half percent. So that's been the highest in five years. More to come. Thanks. Mr. Pacino? No. Okay. Uh, next uh, report, uh, bylaw committee, Mr. Sylvester. Is he not here? Oh, oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Sylvester, chairman of the bylaw committee. Uh, if you remember, last fall, an instructional motion was passed asking the uh, town and, and specifically, I believe, the bylaw committee to take a look at 
changing our charter and our bylaws to make them gender neutral. We have found that we do not have the authority to change the charter, but we have started in on the work of making the bylaws gender neutral. We have met uh, twice already this year. The uh, first time we uh, divvied up the document and uh, um, went and did our homework on it. The second meeting, which was the uh, beginning of this month, we reported back the uh, changes that we sought for uh, the um, eight sections of the document. We have now taken those eight sections and reassigned them to different members of the committee in order to uh, review the changes that we originally found and we're building that into a, uh, a, a new document where we've tracked the changes. So um, currently we are almost done with the process of going through the bylaws. Our plan is that in the fall we will present to you a series of motions, one which will be, or a series of articles, one article which will cover the entirety of the gender changes that we wish to make and uh, there will be at least one other uh, article with any miscellaneous things that we see. We do not want to uh, um, get those two mixed up, but uh, we should be ready for you in the fall with the, uh, with the bylaws, and we're still discussing what needs to happen. We believe we need a charter committee or a charter commission to look into the um, changes to the charter. Thank you. Ms. Alvarado moves that we lay the uh, Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Friedman moves that we um, place the substance of Article 3 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 4, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For new town meeting members, um, capital as one portion of a budget happens in two steps. Uh, the first thing is that an item must be placed into a capital plan. That by itself does not authorize any spending on the, on the item, um, but you can't spend any money if something's not on the plan. So Article 4 is defining what is in the capital plan, and I'll go over it um, in a moderate amount of detail. Uh, Please raise your hand and slow me down if I go too fast. There's essentially no changes in FY18 for transparency. The school committee requested that we change the name of one of the capital items, if you will, uh, district-wide technology network projects, uh, instead of just the narrower definition wireless access points for the remainder of that project. Um, just for the clarification and information to town meeting, um, it's not capital, but we often list changes in debt just because sometimes that's relevant. So you can see up there there's a note about some sewer debt. More importantly for the FY19 budget, these are changes that are proposed since last November's town meeting when we do the bulk of the capital planning work. After some discussion with the police chief, the superintendent, the facilities director, and myself, um, there's a few things I want to discuss about the facilities um, security study building security study. One is there was no piece of 450000 which was in the capital plan that could be spent on any aspect of the project that didn't spe specify one school or one building. And we thought that would be in very bad form to pick one school or one building to start the work um, without the larger project going forward. But there was in FY21 about the same amount, 500000 to work on the dispatch center. And after discussion, it was sensible that that be moved up first because that will be the central hub of all the security um, that we're going to suggest. And a couple things um, on security. First, I'm happy to say um, it's not money in the bank by any means, but three million of the four million dollar um, request that we have probably will be in, this, in the bond bill as agreed to the House and the Senate um, for the budget this year. Being in the bond bill, 
much like the Main Street project, means sometime in the next 10 years you might see funding. So again, it's not cash on the barrel, but it's a good step forward, and it's certainly, unfortunately, a very important topic. And we do think we'll be um, receiving a lot of attention for this because of all the things in the bond uh, bill, we are absolutely shovel ready to work on school security. Um, and also as a reminder, and the superintendent will mention this uh, next Thursday, Wednesday, May 23rd in the Scatini Library in this building at 6 p.m., again at 6 p.m., there'll be a school security uh, summit. That's for parents and interest in residents to come hear what we are allowed to say about uh, school building security. Clearly there's some things we can't say, but we realize there's quite a bit we could say just for the um, edification of the community. So you can see there's a couple uh, capital items swapped around in FY19. And importantly, after the override, and thank you for those that voted, and we'll continue to work hard for anyone that might not have voted for it, Bill. Five, five percent, five percent of the 4.15 million by FinCom policy belongs in capital. So that's 207,500 uh, in agreement with the superintendent and myself. We agreed to put that fund funding temporarily through this article into the permanent building committee, the line. So they now have, would have 357,500. We don't know yet what they may do. I know the school committee intends to meet with them at some point this summer, if not sooner, um, and discuss kill them, certainly as one objective. If there is no immediate need for funding for the permanent building committee sometime in the fall, um, we may uh, point this towards some other capital need, but for now that seemed to be the best place uh, to put that extra money. You can see there's a number of other changes. Uh, some of them were made in the general fund last November, but not in the enterprise funds. We did not make any changes. So you'll see things like the downtown infrastructure assessment um, in all, all of the enterprise funds. And for completeness, we show FY20 for the bond rating agencies. I won't dwell on it other than to say, again, that, um, that override that was passed will add to the capital spending plan 200,000 plus forever for every year. So that is a great benefit to the capital plan as well. Um, and lastly, again, there's some small changes in the enterprise funds in the out years. Um, the bond rating agencies like you to see per firsthand two years worth in addition to the current year. FinCom report, Ms. Perry. committee met March 7th, 2018 and voted 7-0-0 to support the uh, proposed amendments to the capital plan. And then we also met on April 11th with, for the additional 207,500 and unanimously supported that. Is there further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 5, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. There's one uh, minor change to what you'll see, but let me just go through the articles very quickly, or the items. <clears throat> Line B91, we see every couple of years a 111F, which is an injured on duty retirement, unfortunately for one of our public safety uh, personnel. Um, that is a wage, not as an expense. Um, so we have to add that into the budget at this point. Um, we are more than able to pay for that, if you will, from savings on health insurance premiums and actuarial services. Um, I have a negotiation scheduled for May. I hope to have some very good news with future health insurance, but we'll see. In your Warren article report, rather, there's um, some savings on capital projects that are closed out for which there was a surplus. We don't typically tend to do that, but this year there was a little bit more than usual. So we're able to reallocate the 83,500. Um, vocational school spending is always a mystery. We were just told today what our uh, budget request for FY19 should be for the um, Northeast Retro School. Unfortunately, we don't have as much as their 7.5% increase requests. So town meeting is always asked to amend this figure just because we don't get timely information. Um, there's a shortfall on property and casualty insurance premiums. There's a number of vacant positions, um, primarily in town hall. Um, we've seen actually a downturn in veterans benefits paid, which is a little bit of a surprise. 
Um, we are just as busy in that area, but just the amount of payments and the amount of um, applicants, unfortunately, has decreased. We did have a new treasurer put in place in the last year and had a small overlap. So we had not anticipated that or funded it. Um, we have um, some requests from public safety for uh, additional wage funding, as you can see. Um, all but last year, when we've asked town meeting to provide extra funding, we've actually turned more than that back. Um, this year, I don't think we will turn it all back. I think we'll need some of this. Um, but it's just so difficult to forecast June. Um, last June, we had a large fire, for instance. <clears throat> Again, a couple of a couple more vacancies were able to save some money in um, both public safety and engineering. And the one change from the warrant report, um, until tonight, we were terrified to actually finalize a number on snow and ice. I was sitting in Christopher's last Wednesday with three other area town managers, and we looked out and it was snowing. <laughs> Just seemed impossible. Um, so hopefully tonight's uh, request for 300,000, and I believe DPW has spent approximately 270, so that leaves a little cushion for one more storm. Um, and that will, that will require the use of free cash, everything else balanced out, uh, but this request for snow and ice will dip into free cash, as you can see. Um, there was a typo in the warrant. It's, it's not material, but one of the subtotal lines was, was incorrect. All the totals are correct. For the enterprise funds, um, there's really nothing terribly interesting. The MWRA debt, we got an interest-free loan we didn't anticipate, so we need to be able to pay that. The MWRA assessment in sewer was higher than we expected in water. It was lower but we have to account for the sewer. And we had some drainage work in the Haven Street area. We've budgeted 100,000. We didn't expect to spend that unless we hit ledge. I've not heard yet what, what is gonna happen. Um, those are the current year spends. Whoops, I guess, and that's all for, um, you can see in the warrant there's a couple of out year things, but that's the important ones for tonight. FinCom report, Ms. Johnson. Finance Committee. Uh, at our meeting on March 7th, 2018, we voted 700 to recommend this article. And tonight at our Finance Committee meeting, prior to town meeting, we voted 500 to recommend um, the $300,000 allocation of free cash to cover the deficit for snow and ice. Is there further discussion? Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 8, member of the Cemetery Board of Trustees. Uh, I'd like to thank the town manager for the trailer. It doesn't make up for our $2 million building, but it, it's a good <laughs> start. Um, it will save approximately one hour per man every time they go out of Lower Hill to mow. So it, it's not big money, but it will help us. Hopefully next year we can put some more in. And a little personal note, I understand from my Little bird told me that it's uh, the moderator's birthday today, so happy oh. birthday, Ellen. <laughs> I mean, thank you, but you're all out of order. <laughs> um, further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, a couple of questions on some of the positions here. Um, can you explain why the animal control is down that much? Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we have an animal control part-time officer who's also um, the one that gives out tickets. Right. That has not changed. We had hoped with a prior budget to regionalize animal control, and thus we also asked for money as an expense instead of a wage. Uh, the community we were going to do that with has changed their mind and, and gone back to an old staffing model. Um, we like to think we found a new partner in Wakefield, so we'll be able to do this next year, but the 50000 was never useful as an expense for that purpose this year. Thanks. On these uh, vacant positions, the economic development and the um, civil engineer, are those actively being trying to be built? Um, yes, um, two, two different stories. Um, 
I counted over the weekend the town, including the override, which we're very appreciative for, has 26 vacancies. Um, it is a very difficult market to hire into. The engineering vacancy specifically has been advertised, and we've gone through three sets of interviews for the last year. Um, at least one candidate has accepted the job and then changed their mind. So it's a very difficult market. As you can imagine, engineering very much competes with the private sector, and, and we're not the private sector. Um, economic development director, ours went to California in the winter. He's now spearfishing. Um, there has been a first round of interviews. That process is undergoing, or, or I should say underway to fill. We hope to be able to fill that soon. Thank you. I have two more questions quickly. Um, so my husband and I were saying that, I mean, the wages are generally not too competitive here. Are you, have you done an overall wage study for these positions in town, or is there one? Should we? Um, I'm, I'm not remembering exactly how many years ago, but we did a very thorough non-union one, I'm going to say five years ago. It's probably out of date. Um, I'm very satisfied with the work that was done on that and the subsequent progress we made in very difficult budgets to address that. Um, our hope is to be able to pay mean or average. Um, we have not done that work with the unions. That's a little bit more complex. Um, I'm satisfied that uh, at least some of our unions are above average in pay, and I hope none of them are too terribly far behind in pay. Um, I'm constantly amazed, though, when we post a job for say $80,000 or seventy-five dollars to $80,000, and every other community advertises the same thing, that they're paying ninety-five. So when we say something, we do it. Other communities seem to have a little more creativity than we do. Um, in, a, in a good, strong uh, employment market, we're never going to look like an attractive employer for many positions. When the economy turns, all of a sudden, we're, we're very attractive. We just try to do the best we can with that. My uh, last question is, I thought that the head of Parks and Forestry hadn't been filled for a while. I don't know the status of that recently, but wasn't there savings from that also? Um, that's a complicated story, and I'd rather not to say too much other than we have... No, I just meant in terms of the actual dollars, in terms of this. I don't need to know the details of the position, but um, um, I meant in terms of... I'm interviewing policy. a finalist right now, so I'd really rather not comment further, Marilyn. Okay. I will say that we had someone take the job since Bob right. retired, and he lasted less than a year, so there's been right. some turnover. Okay, thank you. For the discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 6. Uh, I don't believe we have any prior bills, is that right? Correct. Okay. Mr. Ensminger moves that we lay the uh, substance of Article 6 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. It's laid on the table. Business under Article 7. Ms. Engstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to approve the disposition of surplus property. There are seven assets in total, and they're listed on the slide. Their estimated values are between $500 and $6,000. Approval of this article will allow the town to sell, exchange, or dispose of these items. FinCom report, Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting on March 7th, Finance Committee voted 7-0-0 to recommend this article. Is there further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 8. Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to approve the transfer of OPEB contributions that were approved as part of the fiscal 18 budget to the OPEB Irrevocable Trust. The total amount of the transfer is $576,000. $500,000 is from the general fund, $50,000 from the water, twenty dollars from sewer, and six dollars from the stormwater. It should be noted that the $500,000 for the general fund does not fully cover our annual required contribution to fully fund that liability within a 30-year period, whereas the enterprise funds are fully funding their annual required contribution and will be fully funded by 2030. Income report, Mr. Mall. meeting on March 7th, 2018, the Finance Committee voted 7-0-0 to recommend this article. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 9, Ms. Angstrom.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to amend the bylaw um, related to the inspections revolving fund. Prior to um, municipal modernization, we used to update these revolving funds that fall under section 53E and a half just by updating a table with all the details related to each one. Post municipal modernization, we actually can only approve the spending limits annually and then the bylaw has to be updated. So what we've done here is showing you the actual bylaw that we have um, for the inspection revolving fund. Anything that is in bold has been added. Anything that's been stricken is being taken out. And what we're trying to do here is, is, is be all inclusive. So there were three projects, three large capital projects that started the inspections revolving fund. And we're looking to add five new ones. Um, so you'll see that there are eight projects being listed. And just to be all inclusive, they're the three old and five new ones that we're looking to add. And this would allow for any fees that we charge these developments coming in to go into this revolving fund and then be used to cover the monitoring of these large capital projects. Income report, Mr. Neshat. Oh, Ms. Perry. Quick substitution. Um, fin <laughs> Finance Committee met March 7th and voted 700 to approve this article as written. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. So I guess I'm, I'm just curious. So we're making the bylaw project specific? Yes. I mean, is that really a good practice? I mean, it says we now have, what, $90 million worth of new development going on, so every town meeting or in between, we're gonna, you have to wait for us to adjust the bylaw before you can get funds into the revolving fund if a new project comes up in the interim? Mr. Lalasha. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. A couple of years back under so-called municipal modernization, um, the rules of this changed. The bylaw used to be vague and not list any projects. And then in the article that you would approve every year with a list of revolving funds, there would be a list of projects. Um, the, the approach has changed under municipal modernization. So the action annually on town meeting is only a spending limit and not a list of projects. So if you actually see some of the, um, list, uh, some of the projects in the list here, some of them are old. Um, they happened in that old method when town meeting used to approve projects. Right, understood. Whereas the old bylaw did not have them. So I don't think it's a terribly efficient way at all, but there's no other mechanism to do that other than to come to this body annually. Um, so, whether so it should be done in a bylaw or not, I, I guess I leave to council, but that's, that's the most clear way. Okay, okay I I'm certainly would have suggested not to do that if we didn't have to, but I'm getting the impression you're telling me that we have to. Mr. Washer. Um, we just don't know legally of any other way since we can't do it the way we used to do it, which is just to list a table, have you approve everything in the table, which was, just, which was the list of projects and the spending limit. Municipal modernization only allows you to approve the spending limit, so there has to be a list of projects somewhere. And a bylaw seems to be uh, the only place we can think of to put it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Sylvester? On their uh, meeting of March 12th, the bylaw committee voted to recommend the subject of this article by a vote of 4-0-0. Is there another hand down here? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brad Van Magnus, uh, Precinct 6. Just a, a question, is it possible that we could, instead of defining each of the individual projects, instead define as the uh, article is written here, that a large construction project is defined as X, Y, Z, whatever that may be, because the, the wording of this uh, specifically states that this is for large construction projects and shall be expended by the town manager. So can we just put some boundaries around what a large project actually is and that then encompasses any future projects. Do we have a response? <laughs> yes. Town Council. I guess the answer is 
yes, you could do it if you could come up with a definition that actually worked. Um, I guess I wouldn't encourage town meeting right now to try to come up with that definition, but um, the way this is set up, we're probably going to be revisiting this every year until somebody comes to their senses at the state level. Um, <laughs> so, so we have plenty of opportunity to think through if there's a way to anticipate what kinds of projects are going to come and then come up with a definition. Um, uh, for now, it seemed just easier to just to name the, the projects that, that are going into this fund. Yes. So just to follow up, I, I, I think that obviously there's some sort of boundary that is existing somewhere. So perhaps, I'm not sure which body would be best to discuss that, but uh, having pulled permits for various different projects as a resident in the town, we obviously understand that there are, you know, quote unquote, normal, small projects. And we obviously understand that there are abnormal, larger projects. And so somewhere we know that there's a boundary. We just need to define it. And I think that needs to be done before we take further action on this. Mr. Lalatta. Um, I can think of three ways. Um, the worst way is probably estimated construction value, because who knows? Um, the second way is commercial square footage, and the third way is residential units or residential square footage. On the, in the 40 yard district, of course, the last two would be combined. Um, while that may be an interesting discussion, I don't know that you're going to save a lot of discussion on town meeting floor because we're always going to have to explain why a project fits or doesn't fit in a certain parameter. Um, again, um, this approach is somewhat cumbersome and somewhat slow. But large projects don't usually move fast. So meeting twice a year for town meeting is, I don't think, an unreasonable burden uh, to place on you know, the spending of the permit fees. And again, a large project really is meant to be one-time fees associated with one-time costs, such as extra hours with the building inspector. Further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Nick Wavin, Precinct 7. Three quick points, I think, for the town manager on this. Um, first point is the way I read this, the word including, um, right above commons, include, I'm sorry, include building. So you, could you interpret this to have your cake and eat it too, meaning it anything, if the include modifies, Sorry. it just changed text, Sorry. where are we? You're moving, is this the right, the right text here? Yeah. Okay, so if, you, if include building, right, so I, I think the discussion is assuming that include only modifies what comes immediately after it, building, plumbing, et cetera, gas, and other permit fees. What if the include also modified the list of the schoolhouse commons, Reading Village, et cetera? So I could read this, when I read it multiple times sitting there, I could read this either way. So, it's, so yes, we're compliant with the state required state rules to, to enumerate projects once a year, but if we had a project that needed to be added to this list, the list includes all of these specified projects and any others, that we, as long as it at least includes those. So that would be point one, was that I, I can see a reading in where, where, where you, you could add to this list and then update it after the fact at town meeting and still be compliant with what I understand the, the state requirement to be. Uh, the second point is what other towns do, right, because all towns are under the same state guidance and have we looked at that and is there an alternative, um, if, if what I'm proposing won't work, is there an alternative in another town's bylaws that would make it unnecessary to come back to town meeting every time to amend this list? Um, so on, on either of those points, is, is there any comment? And I guess. Um, the, the third point is, could we delegate this authority to the Permanent Building Committee or some other competent body within our town government that would allow us the flexibility to address this without having to come back to town meeting every, um, every time we meet twice a year? So those three points. Thank you. 
Okay, do we have a response? Or think about it for a minute. Mr. Meares? I'll answer the second question first. Um, the, uh, I'm now extrapolating from the towns that, um, that our firm rep represents. Uh, the usual um, uh, revolving fund that we see includes all of the um, fees for everything. So this is the only one that I know about where the, the idea is to limit it only to large projects in, in the revolving fund. So we don't run into this situation in, in the other towns that we represent. I don't know if that's helpful, but there it is. Um, um, I believe that the intended meaning here um, um, was for include to mean the building, plumbing, wiring, and gas and other permit fees. Um, the, um, and, and to specify, and, and that the specified projects are the ones that are gonna go in there. Uh, um, I don't think it's been an, uh, I, I don't think that there is a problem with um, uh, uh, regularly adding and subtracting from, uh, from this list. Uh, the, um, as Bob said, that we can, we conveniently meet twice a year, and um, so we usually can anticipate when, when the fees are going to be coming in, and, and uh, so it, this is a little awkward because we shouldn't have to amend the bylaw to do this. We should be able to just do it by, uh, by a town meeting vote, but that's what the law requires, so that's what we're going to do. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I'm reading this, and um, is our current fee structure set up enough to cover these, these costs? It sounds like we're looking for additional money. I heard the word overtime, et cetera. Do we need to revisit our permit fees to cover these costs? Jean Delios, Assistant Town Manager. I'm also the department head for the Public Services Department. Includes eight divisions. One of them is building inspection. The um, permit fees that we charge, we have looked at, I've been here nine years, I'll say eight times. Um, the amount of data that I have on what how Reading's fees compared to the other communities is fairly staggering. We don't think that we are undercharging for the building permit fees. Where the real uh, value comes in is the estimating of the cost of the construction. And I like to tell a story about um, an applicant that came in not long ago to put a deck on. And the building inspector, I, I happened to be at the counter that morning with the building inspector, and the cost of putting, and this is just an average deck on an average home in the town of Reading, the cost of the project was $40,000. Um, it's mind-boggling to me that a deck costs $40,000. But that's what it costs, and it's probably even more now. So my point is, um, having a, a very experienced um, staff of building inspectors who very carefully do the estimate of the cost of the construction, I think is the real key to getting the fee correctly. Because that's the number that you're basing the, the uh, per square footage on. Um, we probably will be doing some more work on, again, revisiting the fees. Um, we think there's probably some ways that we can simplify and update, um, but more towards the electrical 
and plumbing fees and gas fees. They're very minor. The, we've done the analysis and the, um, the, the total benefit to the community will be very small. But um, we are every day looking at every detail on making sure that the fees are, that we're collecting, the, the total amount that we're collecting is uh, a, a fair representation. Um, I'll allow you there. <laughs> this probably goes back to you. Go ahead. Um, Take your shots. The fees are based on projected uh, costs of the projects. Are we capturing final costs? Because most projects increase in scope and size. Um, typically, a lot of towns, they ask for a final cost affidavit and adjust their permit fees accordingly. They, we very often go back uh, if the scope of the project has changed, yes. Do we ask for it? on a regular basis? Yeah. Any large project, should we? Okay. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Okay. It's been asked that we defer action on uh, Article 10. So Mr. Berman moves that we lay the substance of Article 10 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Opposed? Motion carries. Article 10 is laid on the table. Article 11, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to approve the spending limits on the revolving funds that fall under Section 53E and a half of Chapter 44. They are the same um, revolving funds that we approve every year, and the spending limits remain unchanged. Mr. Doxer, income report. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, at our meeting of March 7th, FinCom voted 700 to recommend this article. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Good morning. Uh, Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, I noticed that the material cabin had a new roof on it. Who paid for that? Yeah, facilities has a budget for each one of the buildings that they manage, so likely that's where it was paid from. Yeah. Any idea what the estimated cost of that was? Do you know? Besides decks and building inspection fees, I'm also responsible for Matera Cabin. Um, that comes under conservation. And um, the uh, issue with Matera Cabin was a tree fell on it in one of the storms. And I believe facilities um, quickly got the work done because recreation uses it for a lot of the programming, so they were trying to get it back online. Mm -hmm. I think there was some insurance that covered it, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Does, does the building pay for itself? No. Then why, do, why don't we shut it down? Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? The motion carries. Business under Article 12, Ms. Delios. Now I'm going to put my affordable housing hat on. Thank you. Uh, this article is the um, article where town meeting is asked to approve an allocation plan for the affordable housing trust fund. This trust fund was established under Chapter 140 of the Acts of 2001. And the fund is a resource for producing new or preserving existing affordable housing. This is a fund for affordable housing activity that the town otherwise wouldn't have money for. It does not come out of the tax levy. Um, the warrant notes that we recently updated the housing production plan and I'm very pleased to say that since this was um, printed, that plan has been approved by the Board of Selectmen and by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So we do have an updated 
and certified housing production plan. The reason I bring that up is the housing production plan really is the roadmap for the town to follow in creative and um, unique ways that we can be thinking about affordable housing. And the more that we can be proactive in the area of affordable housing that is Redding's version of what that might look at, the better prepared we are and potentially um, the production part of the housing production plan gets us to where we need to be per the state requirements under Mass General Law Chapter 40B. Basically, the state says we have to have 10% of our housing as deed restricted affordable housing units, and that's not an easy thing to, to do. Reading is on the brink of that, that's the good news. Um, so this fund, it really is there as another tool uh, potentially to do things related to production of affordable housing, funding of affordable housing, creating new affordable housing, preserving existing, converting units, and there's a small amount that can be used for administration. Thank you. FinCom report, Ms. Perry. Finance Committee met March 7th, 2018 and voted 700 to approve this article as written. Further discussion? Done appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Oh, there's a hand. I'm sorry, I still don't see it. Oh, Ms. O'Neill. Okay. Yep, thank you. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, can you give us an update on, uh, or just um, let us know? I've, I've heard this over the years, but not in a while. What funds this trust fund, and have we had any expenditures? Uh, do you have some sort of goal for, you know, using some of this money? and? I mean, it's not very much when it comes to housing, but um, I'm interested to see. I, I think you can do it to, um, for maintenance, not maintenance, but like repair and keeping things looking nice, because we do, doesn't the town own some units itself? The or town. not, the, I mean, the Reading Housing Authority does have Yes, some. the town side does not own any affordable housing right. units. Right, right. Is um, can any of this money be used by the Reading Housing Authority, or is it only? It requires a, a vote of the Board of Selectmen and the Housing Authority Board before you can actually authorize any expenditures. So it's the dual boards that need to vote. Um, the funds that are in, in there um, have come mostly through developer agreements through CBDC. And um, most of that happened before my time. So I don't have a really good list of how that happened. One affordable unit at Sumner Cheney, they could not find an affordable buyer. This was maybe six years ago. And um, at that point, they were allowed under the state regulations to sell the, the unit as a, what they call market rate unit. So the difference between the affordable and the market rate went back into this fund. Um, that was a couple hundred thousand. And then shortly after that, um, the two boards got together and approved um, Oak Tree, this is 30 Haven Street, an allocation of 200,000 for that development project. So it, one kind of washed the other. Um, otherwise, I think this balance has been there for a long time, and all the, the only thing we really see changing is some amount of interest every year. Is there any good use we could put it to, or some portion of it? <coughs> we or talk about it in the housing production plan, about this being a resource and the town, you know, wanting probably to have more community discussion about the best way to go about using the funds. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing because the funds, it, it's not enough money to fund an actual program. I've done, a, I've done a lot of affordable housing over my many years in government, and um, in order to do any kind of significant affordable housing, you really need more than a couple hundred thousand. You really, it's not enough to start a program. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Further discussion? None appearing, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. 
Those opposed? And the motion carries. Article 13, we've been asked to postpone that until Thursday. Uh, Mr. Berman moves that we lay the substance of Article 13 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And Article 13 is laid on the table. Business under Article 14. Uh, bylaw Committee, Mr. Sylvester, are you making a presentation? At their meeting of March 12th, the Bylaw Committee voted to recommend the subject of this article to town meeting by a vote of 4-0-0. Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. Lippin. Good evening, uh, John Lippin, Precinct 7. I would like to move to amend this motion to change the words executive board and the three occurrences in the article to a select board. Okay, is there a second? Second, Mr. Levitt. Yeah, so I just note that um, I think it's over 89 towns in Massachusetts have now changed the board of selectmen to select board to make it gender neutral. That seems to be the way things are going. It aligns better with the state um, laws which still say board of selectmen. I also don't like executive board because it sounds very corporate, very executive, very top-down command and control style of, uh, of authority or operation, whereas in a democratic uh, institution like this, uh, like our, our select board or board of selectmen, uh, the, it's important that it be a democratic process with open meetings, with open discussion, with open interaction, and uh, take in uh, um, input from the community and residents and not be a sort of executive top-down um, uh, process. So that would be my argument for that. Thank you. Okay. From this point, we'll be discussing the proposed amendment. Is there further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Lalasha? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, further discussion? Yes, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Russ Graham, Precinct 4. I support the amendment, probably for different reasons. Although I did search in the budget to see if we were going to have executive bathrooms or executive parking. Uh, my concern is history. We don't need to throw out all of history, just that bad part of history. Certainly we've come to the conclusion that denoting that only men are going to serve in the Board of Selectmen or anywhere else was bad history. But the reason that they are called Selectmen now is because once all decisions were made by town meeting, there weren't too many people then. But as we got a little more complicated, Ebenezer and Joshua had crops to bring in and cows to milk and really didn't have time to run down to the meeting house on a regular basis. And so, they did not say that anyone was select. They selected certain people that they trusted and wanted to serve in that capacity between town meetings. They never were happy to say, gave up the appropriating authority. But, here we are, and I have to tell you, I cannot believe that there has ever been a selection in the town of Reading who has not been proud to be selected by their fellow citizens to represent them between town meetings. So I really think little by little we're dropping away our history and forgetting where things started, even though they have in most cases served us very well. So let's keep that part of history and let's keep it the select board and that's not something, as Mr. Rensminger has said, that you get uh, down at Home Depot. It is, in fact, I, I never even remember it being referred to as the select board. It's the board of selectmen. It would be the board of select people. And I think that's appropriate, and it continues to remind us of how this all began. Thank you. Ms. Binder. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I raised my hand at the same time as Mr. Graham, so I don't know that I can uh, say anything that he hasn't said. So I'm just going to read 
from American government Magruder's uh, for a moment that says townships have always been made in town meet township laws have always been made in the town meeting during the first few years the colonists attempted to hold monthly meetings but this was found to be a cumbersome way to transact business and as early as 1635 select men officers selected by the people were chosen to administer the affairs of the township during the interval between assemblies um, I'm in uh, I support the change from executive to select because I think it's um, in keeping with history. Thank you. Further, another right down here. Yes, uh, Ms. Borowski. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jean Borowski, Precinct Six. I am inclined to support this amendment as well and work towards the um, uh, towards the select board as opposed to an executive. And my rationale is a little different than what we've heard. I think if the goal is gender neutrality, executive makes a little bit more sense. What I like about select board is it's very gender inclusive. So if you are elected to that board, you can be a select man, a select woman, a member of the select board. So it's incredibly inclusive of all genders. Um, so I'm inclined to support the amendment. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Uh, just curious, um, I never really thought of this as an issue, but I, I understand why, I guess, nowadays. Um, but are there any administrative or legal costs that will be associated with these changes? I guess Do we documents have, have to have change, response? everything else, anything else? Mr. Right Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. For this change, I'd say the cost is very nominal. Um, if you were to do, go through a charter change and this was the only reason you were doing it, that's more costly. That involves mailing a charter uh, to every voter. Um, the way this process has been proposed by the bylaw committee is to defer the action on a charter till such time as when there's other reasons to do a charter change. So I think this approach is very reasonable and, and very modest in cost. By modest is range Let's see. Yeah, Mr. Lasher. Thousands, 20,000. I'd have to look at a legal bill, but it hasn't been very much. I'd spend certainly less than $1,000. No. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for a vote on the proposed? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Cynthia Cool, Precinct 6. I'm just wondering how many towns have already started this uh, process of switching over to gender neutrality um, in their bylaws? Does anyone know? Mr. Lalasha. Point of order, should the debate be on the amendment and not the motion uh, itself? Technically speaking, but I think this is a fairly general question for both sides. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I will say there's very, very few communities that have done anything legally. Um, many towns have chosen to refer to themselves in different ways, with select boards clearly being the most common. Um, but from my direct knowledge in town council's research, very few have yet to endorse a legal change the way we are suggesting. We think this is the better way to do it. That's not to say that all the communities that have made a reference change won't ultimately take a legal route, though. Further discussion? I, um, I just went to the Oxford Dictionary and I looked up selectmen and it's not, has no gender at all associated with it. While I realize selectman sounds like a man, it's a person that represents a board, the board of selectmen. <laughs> so anyway, there are a number of words in the English language that have no gender. Omnis, om, 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 ombudsman. There are many, there are several words that I looked up before I came here that have no gender associated with them. But I mean, you're looking at changing the English dictionary at this point to change this over just to make it um, gender neutral. I, I personally like the history of it. It's, uh, it's a word that comes out of New England, um, just being a selectman comes out of um, our heritage. And to change it is sort of, I don't, I don't think it even matters because we do already have a woman. Weren't we just selected, didn't we just select one? Well, into you're, now, you're now slipping away from the... Well, I'm just saying. Yes, the question, the question for us is right now I, is do we, change, do we amend this from executive board to select board? I would, 
Well, so, I would rather leave it as it was, if okay. that's possible. You, that, that would be a question for the next part of it. Okay. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4, and a member of this group of fine people. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually, I think it was you, Mr. Moderator, that said when it was first started, it was the group of seven wonderful folks that uh, in, in would, 16... Would, would you like the exact name? Yes, please. Seven men chosen for the prudential affairs of the town. Right. So, and that was what, 16... 1644. 16, 16, yeah. So, <laughs> having, um, having been old enough um, to remember when the word Ms. came into, um, into language, it wasn't something that people voted on, it was just stuff that people used. Um, and I think that as we've gone to a lot of meetings here, a lot of folks have sort of um, encompassed the notion that a group of people who are elected to support the, uh, or, or represent the town, um, it should be done in a gender neutral way, which, which I support. Um, I, I like the notion of select board um, because it does harken back to history. Um, this group, this body, town meeting, is the oldest and purest form of democracy that still exists in the world today. I know sometimes it's, we sit here and it's boring and it's messy and it's chaotic, but there is nothing like this in the world where groups of people come together in a town meeting. It is no, no other place in the country and no other place in the world. The fact that selectmen was how it was first started, um, I don't want to lose that part of history by changing it to something like select committee or you know, uh, executive board, board or executive committee. Um, I want to keep some of the thing that makes our history, um, keeps, it, keeps it here. I mean, that's the one thing about New England is, is our history. Um, so I think select board encompasses both, it, it encompasses two tasks. One is that it recognizes um, the gender neutrality that we've all you know, striven, strive to get to and it keeps us deeply rooted in, in the democratic process of what Reading and, and New England is all about. So I don't know if this passes what I'm going to call myself. I, I guess maybe a member of the board. Maybe I'll choose selectman. Um, maybe Ms. Alvarado will be select woman. It doesn't really matter what we choose to call ourselves. I think what it really matters is what, the, what this group is called to represent the rest of us. So, you know, I don't really think it's that important for us to be sort of, well, what are you going to be? It's what is this body going to be um, in, you know, to the, relative to the town. So I support um, the amendment uh, to make it a select board, um, and I hope that that passes. Thank you. Further discussion on that? Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Jeff Struble, Precinct 7, and also a member of the Bylaw Committee. Uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, we looked, uh, the Bylaw Committee went after this and sort of being literal about what we thought the uh, instructional motion was uh, trying to achieve, and that was essentially to eliminate any kind of gender suggestion in the, in the title of this board before us, uh, be they select or be they executive. Um, I think when the subject, I also agree with Mr. Lippitt's research about how all the rest of the uh, towns, when, when going this direction, would, would call them select board. That's what we found. So we agree with that. It's, 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 it's uh, the norm, I guess, nowadays, and ch changing to this. So we would be adopting that uh, if, you know, we'd be right in step with everyone else if we did it. But um, in talking about uh, calling these folks um, select board, I think it was always it was already demonstrated that someone said, well, we can call, you know, when we're referring to them, we'll call them a select man or a select woman. Still gender. There's still gender there um, when you're referring to that. But if you call them executive, it's an executive board member. Um, that's essentially where the justification came in for, for choosing executive or rec recommending executive over select is that um, it does sort of force the, the issue of gender away from what you call them and when you're referring to them. That's really all there is. That's the only reason. Essentially, it's, it's, if you want to call them, you know, call them select board, fine. I wouldn't, I may even support the amendment myself. I'll decide by the time I 
go back to my seat. Um, but I think you should know, understand where, where this came from, why we voted we, the way we did, and where I think it came from in, in this motion. We were trying to eliminate any suggestion or any uh, need to refer to gender when, when talking about members of, the board, of that board. And executives seem to be the way to do that. And so I put that in your, uh, before you as something to think about before you take a vote on this amendment. Um, whether an, um, another thing to think about is if you would call them, you know, the sele select board as opposed to selected board. There's a little hint of elitism there um, when you're talking about the select few <laughs> who sit at that table. Uh, another thing to think about, again, it may, you may not think it's, it's, it's important, but these are the things that, you know, when you're talking about language, uh, they, they creep into your thought process. So, um, and I think executive is, is apt for what, what their function is. Um, they don't have necessarily oversight over the, everything that the town does, we do. <laughs> Uh, what town, town meeting does. If you don't believe that, you shouldn't be here. Um, but um, it is essentially it's sort of a description of what, what they do in, in their, uh, their volunteering for, for the town. And I think it's, it's, it's an apt description of them and it could be reflected in, the, in their title. So it's just something to think about, as they say, I'm playing devil's advocate and I'm, I'm going to have a long thought as I walk back to my seat. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, come back to you just a second, Mr. Walasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I just thought I might make a comment that I made to the uh, selectman uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, this is a legal change in a bylaw. This is not just a reference. Um, please bear with us because we'll have to work through this legal change and you may not see things the way you imagine. So for instance, currently there's a set of policies called the Board of Selectmen Policies. Technically, this article does not change that. So I'm going to have to be working with town council on many such instances to see if it's just okay to change the term or whether we have to have a public hearing because a public hearing adopted those original words. So whatever the, the body wishes to do tonight, just please understand we're making a legal change and we'll step through it as expeditiously but carefully as possible. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. I, I guess two points. If I were a female on the selectmen, I guess I would not want to be called a selectman, so just personal perspective. But just in general, I think, you know, females, we are, I think it's pretty evident are uh, disproportionately represented on boards in general. So, I mean, I think we should do something to make that, uh, you know, uh, more appropriate. Thank you. Further discussion? Are we, yes. I've called on the one in the middle here first, and then we'll get back to you. Thank you. Good evening, Jared Bullier, Precinct 2. Uh, uh, I like where we're going with the history of select uh, board and everything like that. And if we're looking for a neutral term, why not select or? There's a teacher or whatever a teacher teaches. Select or isn't that difficult to do, but obviously that's not what we're up for debate right now, but that's something that can be decided later on. Uh, I think executive makes it sound like a part of a branch of government, which uh, is not necessarily uh, the legislative body. Executive, uh, obviously in the U.S. government, defines uh, one person kind of in charge like the president, as opposed to a legislative body, potentially of select doors in general. Uh, so that's what I think. I think that's a good compromise as far as history is concerned, uh, as, as far as gender, sorry, not uh, neutrality, but inclusively, inclusiveness is concerned, and that's my two cents. Thank you. And yes, next. Kevin Breer, Precinct 3. Is it possible to move the question? You can move the question if you'd like. This would move it on the proposed amendment. I would accept that. Is there a second to that? Okay, this requires a two thirds vote. Um, Counters, Mr. Brown, would you take the uh, right side of the hall? Mr. Crooks, the right side of the middle. And let's see, I have Ms. Hillary, you're going to take the far left. And Mr. Rushworth, would you take the, the, uh, my left side of the middle? And Ms. Hillary, you do the, the selectman. And Mr. Brown, you've got the um, finance committee as well. Okay, all those in favor of ending debate, please rise.
39. 41. 22. Pardon me? 22. 22. 33. Those opposed to ending debate, please rise. Oh. Two. Hold, hold on one second. Mr. Brown, did, what was your first, your, your, your yes votes? 37. 41. 41. That's what yeah. we thought. Okay. okay. Just, sorry. Just, just checking. Okay. So now the opposed. Okay. Two. Two. Mr. Crook? Three. Three? Ms. Hillary? Oh, still counting. Okay. Sorry. Five. Nine? In Mr. Five. Five. The vote being 135 in the positive, 19 in the negative. The motion uh, is carries. The debate is ended on the proposed amendment. Let me just write that down. Okay, we will now vote on the proposed amendment to change the word executive board to select board. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. We now continue with debate on whether or not we change the name to select board. Further discussion? Yes, in the far right. Hello, uh, Megan Fiddler Carey, Precinct 1. I just wanted to, somebody asked earlier about why I vote on this at all. And um, the one thing that I thought about, I'm relatively new to town meeting, not brand new, but relatively new. And the one thing that I've been really impressed by is everybody's kind of a stickler to the rules and the charters and following the letter of the law. And I think that that's why it's really important that we go through this legal change instead of just doing it as just changing the way that we talk about it because that will get everybody to change the way we talk about it and it'll make it a real thing instead of fracturing us even more and having those who refer to it the old way and those who refer to it the new way so that would be my argument for making sure that we vote on this thank you further discussion yes ms binda angela binda precinct five um, I think words matter, titles matter, um, our language really matters, so it might not be so important to some people, but I, I think it, it is important, and um, I support this completely. Um, there are 90 towns now that have moved in some way from changing the language to uh, Board of Selectmen to select board. I think there's one town, Wakefield, who went with something completely different, ex executive council or something. But over 90, 90 towns from the smallest little towns out in western Massachusetts with just a couple hundred people to Winchester, which just um, decided uh, to put it to a vote. The board decided, and then it went to town meeting, and it just went to a town-wide vote. So they're actually changing their charter. I, I think that we can do this in progressive steps, but I think it is important um, to get the ball rolling and to move forward. Um, I'm not sure how many boards, committees, and commissions. We have about 40, maybe. Uh, we have a lot. And I th more, 50? OK. I think this is the only board that has gender, gendered titles. They are boards, committees, and commissions, and the people on them are called members. They're members. They're, you're a member of the Historical Commission, you're a member of the Trail Commission, you're a member of the CPDC, you're a member of whatever, there's a chair, there's, there, there's, the, this is the only board that has gendered language. And I understand, um, I understand the idea behind going to executive board because then you, there's no mistake of whether you're a select man or select woman. I think that, you know, members of, uh, of the select board, um, I think if somebody says, I can decide if I want to be a select woman or I can decide if I want to be a select man, I think that if we want to be inclusive, if somebody really decides that they want to use that term, then I'm in favor of inclusivity, even if it's not exactly what I would call them. I like the idea that this one board would meet up with all the other 50 boards and become members of the select board. So I'm in favor of this. Further discussion? Yes, on the, yes. 
I'm Patty Koffel from Precinct 5, and I am brand new. It's been fun so far. Thank you. Um, I just want to say um, two quick things. One is when the election process was going on, and there was a uh, select, select people up for election, I was chatting with my 12-year-old daughter about the process and what was happening. And when we knew that Vanessa had won, she said, well, wait a minute, a woman on the selectmen? She didn't get it. She totally thought it had to be men on the selectmen. So if you think that it's just a word that doesn't matter, when you talk to a child who doesn't know the history and doesn't know that that should just mean a man or a woman, that's not the case. It really does matter. It, it really makes a difference whether it has the men on there or not. So I, and I agree with the, the select board. Um, I think we don't have to totally take gender out of it, but to allow for someone to decide it's more inclusive. They, like others have said, they can then choose select person, select man, select woman, select human, select adult, whatever you want to be. It allows it for that inclusiveness, but I think to officially change it so that then everybody does get in that habit of saying select board and board members instead of using selectmen. I think that's, this is a great direction to go. Thank you. I saw a hand just on the other side of the aisle. Yes. Jennifer Cromit, Precinct 3. So when we originally started this discussion, I was in favor of keeping it selectmen. I thought it was implied, but as the discussion continued, it did make me think exactly what she brought up, that young children don't know the implication. And you know, being a young woman, it was ingrained that men equaled guy, male. So I do think that this is a great compromise, and I'm in support of it. And there was another one, the person who just rose. Yes. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I think we're, we're expending a lot of time on this um, when there's bigger fish to fry. Uh, we just spent probably over a half hour here. Um, it's a legal change. It's going to involve a lot of time. I get it. I just think we have bigger fish to fry right now. Get it on a financial um, situation in order and looking towards the future. Um, I just want everyone to stay focused and not uh, get too distracted. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right on the edge. Mr. Moderator, Brad Van Magnus, Precinct 6. I ask that we move the question. Move the question? Okay, we have a motion to move uh, to end debate. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Do I have my counters? We will. All, all those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Eighteen. 18. 24. 39. 39. 32. 32. All those opposed to ending debate, please rise. <laughs> Five. Five. Four. Four. 10. 10. Nine. What was that? Nine. Nine. The vote being 113 in the affirmative, 28 in the negative. The motion carries and debate has ended. We'll now proceed to the vote as amended. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Uh, business under 15, we've been asked to defer that until Thursday. Uh, Mr. Berman uh, moves that we table the substance of Article 15. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 16. Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to authorize borrowing in anticipation of Chapter 90 funding for Fiscal 19 and accept whatever funding becomes available. Currently, we are getting 
or estimates of 593.65. Ms. Uh, Fincom report, Mr. Dock, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of March 7th, Fincom voted 700 to recommend this article. Is there further discussion? Oh, excuse me, do you have a. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, further discussion? Uh, none appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor? Oh, did you see something? I'm sorry, all in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, the motion carries. Okay. Um, everything else, it looks like we need to defer until Thursday night. The town manager has asked before, we, uh, uh, before Thursday night that you read the background information for Article 15, which was passed out at the beginning of this meeting. Now, is there further business for this meeting tonight, or are we ready to adjourn for the evening? We have a motion to adjourn until Thursday evening. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. This uh, town meeting is adjourned until Thursday evening. <laughs>